Hey everybody, Spencer here with a quick update. I just want to say thank you to all of the listeners who submitted the very kind words to Matt and Michael this week on the show. Uh, I love these guys so much, and I'm really sad to see them go. I'm really excited for John and Seth, but you know, M- Michael and Matt are two of my very best friends, and uh, you know, things were changing, and I didn't, I didn't expect to get as sad as I am about seeing them go. I'm really excited for the future, but you know, I, I really love these guys and the kind words that the listeners said and. It, it meant a lot to me, um, actually, and I, I think it honestly meant a lot to them, too. So thank you, everybody, for those kind of words. If you want to listen to J- J- John and Seth's first episodes, go to patreon.com slash ccmtg, become a patron of $12 or more, and you'll have access to their first Pro Tour exclusive episodes that will be recorded here in the next couple of days. Uh, and then they will be on the show next week uh, to talk about the Pro Tour. So thank you, everybody, so much. Enjoy this week's episode where we say goodbye to Matt and Michael, and also talk a little bit about collected company decks. And I learn a lot about uh, green-white collected company decks. Specifically, I have never played Counters Company, and it was interesting to get some insight into that. And then we talk some band spirit. So thank you, everybody, so much, and enjoy this week's episode. Hello, everyone. And welcome to a new episode of Constructive Criticism. I'm your host, Spencer, and I am joined by my co-hosts, Matt Kling. Hey, what's up? And Michael Hinderocker. Also, what's up? And hey, how's it going? <laughs> hey, guys. How are you guys doing this week? Doing good. Yeah, things things going well. Good. Well, this week we are going to talk to you about two things, one of them being collected company decks. Really excited about that. Um, and the other, just saying goodbye to, to Michael and Matt here. So let's get into our sponsors. So don't forget to check out our sponsors at Oasis Games. You can check them out at mtgoasis.com. You can get 15% off of your first order and use the code CCMTG at checkout. And you can get 4% off of every order by using the code Would That Be Good. Uh, you can also check out our other sponsor, Aiden Gaming. You can use the code CCMTG10 at checkout. Uh, and on that one, you'll also get a little bit off. They'll kick us something back. We appreciate both those sponsors a lot. Uh, they actually really <laughs> mean a lot. So thank you so much to both of them. Um, you can also check out the rest of the network. You can go to uh, constructorism.com and see all the other podcasts going on on there. You have Common Knowledge if you like Popper. You've got uh, you know the Even Odds podcast, which is for PPDQs. Uh, so, you know, highly relevant stuff, Michael. Highly relevant. Yeah, for at least like another month. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we really uh, love the things that everybody else is doing around there. So, uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, let's move on to Hashtag Always Improving. Hashtag Always Improving is the point of this podcast. We believe if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And we want to be doing what we can all the time to improve ourselves. Uh, in the spirit of that, uh, I opened up a uh, two, two places for people to ask questions or say goodbye to Matt and Michael, and we're going to use that, uh, the ask hashtag was improving segment, to answer those questions and read those comments. So, haha, Michael, you have to sit through this. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I'm good at sitting. It's one of my... <laughs> it's one of your talents. Yeah. Well, uh, the first... Almost a hobby as well. Yeah. Would you say you sit the majority of the time that you are alive? I mean, if I slept sitting up then definitely i meant to say awake sorry <laughs> it's hard yeah it's hard to be lying down because you know we all sleep for some amount of time i i didn't mean to say alive i meant to say awake <laughs> but you you get what i mean uh the first one is from mason it says i just want to thank hinder father Kling and spencer for always being so approachable and helpful in magic they always took some time to answer my questions or talk about decks and etc uh, you all have helped me improve at Magic so much, and I know I'm not the only one who feels this way about you three. Uh, Hinder Rocker, Kling, you will be missed. That's from Mason. Aw. Yeah, I appreciate so that. Kind. So kind. Uh, it, our relationship with Mason is actually pretty interesting. Like, he was a listener of the podcast that eventually we just became friends with. That's That seems rare. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what happened. Yeah, but Mason's kind of, <laughs> I mean, Mason's kind of great. No, I, I agree. In general. I agree. Yeah. I like Mason. Yeah. I, I don't know. He's just great. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because people are like, why isn't he on the show anymore? And it's like, it's like, uh, I didn't 
I didn't need him to do the thing he was doing, and I wanted to support Mason in other ways. Um, specifically, I actually just think Mason makes a great streamer, and I want to try to do everything I can to support him streaming. So, like, yep. that's that's the real thing. But he's he's super amazing. He's also super messed. Aw. That moment was for Mason Clark, everybody. <laughs> 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 Brian says, what is the number one thing about being on a Magic podcast? Sorry, what is the number one thing being on a Magic podcast about getting better taught you? Matt? Well, the podcast, especially the last time around, I think has taught me some amount of dedication. Um, I'm actually more dedicated to this than I am in most things that aren't specifically magic the gathering which is can i you know, can i say anything which is imp what no i actually want to like say that this uh this is like the th this matt being on this podcast like is probably just shows me how much he loves me just because like you're not you're not like that in other areas and it it means a lot to me yeah so um, thank you. And yeah, the other the other thing it's taught me is what what I always learn from podcast or uh, from it, it, magic more and more is just to like uh, it, it makes me justify things that I that I think and uh, it, teaching really helps you a lot to to learn what you're trying to say right because you can have these these ideas in your mind but when you have to actually back them up with facts it really makes you think about whether you're right in saying what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot. Like, I, I think trying to sort of justify your opinions often helps you learn more about why you think the way you do and why others think the way they do. I think that's a really transferable skill in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, additionally, just like, you know, it's something that both Matt and I have put a lot of time into i mean obviously spencer as well but spencer will continue to put a lot yeah, of yeah Sp spencer's put way more time in than anybody but yeah. that's not the, that's and, not the uh, point but it's it's just you know just continuing to kind of grind away at something it, it's funny like podcasting is kind of like playing magic in that sense right it's like anything you're getting better at in terms of podcasting it, it's slow slow improvement and I, I think that it sort of mirrors it sort of mirrors magic in that sense. Yeah, I I, I agree. It's um, it's funny that I think like uh, Matt kind of spoke to exactly. It's what I what I'm feeling, uh, which is that like you you have to be willing to teach yourself and to how to talk in order to get across anything on a podcast like this. Um, and it, it certainly has made me better at magic in general just by having to put my – I was actually talking about this at work today where I was really frustrated because I was making a slide deck. And my coworker is like, what's so frustrating? And I said, I could tell you this a thousand times because that's what I've practiced in my life is describing things uh, in audio form. But like having to put it on paper is impossible for me. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, they're just all new skills and new uh... – new ceilings to be broken <laughs> uh, and just being willing to sort of put yourself out there and be wrong like you know yeah. and I, I think that we're all what, wrong often that's, i think that what michael said is is true though that it, it does apply to magic right like if you're not willing to be wrong you're not willing to really learn in magic and if you're not willing to be wrong like it's going to be really hard for you to improve definitely yeah i mean i think magic is mostly about critiquing yourself i agree uh the next one's actually from me because <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I'm selfish. I want to know how how is leaving the show gonna impact you guys? Like, what are you gonna do? You have free Monday nights now. Uh, I mean, it's been so long since we actually recorded on a Monday. I feel like it's just random night of the week. But, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I I don't know how it's gonna impact my, you know, actually Magic the Gathering for me, which was the question specifically. Um. I wouldn't say that leaving the podcast is going to affect uh, how much I play magic or anything like that, but I would say that there is a corollary with me leaving the podcast that will probably lead to me not playing a lot of magic. Yeah, but it's not a it's not a cause and effect thing. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 sometimes... I'm convinced that Quentin and I starting this texting thread with you could keep you around for a little while and hopefully. 
uh, as my life changes, hopefully I'll get to play more Magic with you. So that certainly could be a thing. I definitely, I definitely believe that. So yeah, I mean, I think in terms of in terms of changing Magic, I think it just like you know more likely that a lot of the work you put in is little little grinding away on kind of the minutia rather than trying to find big picture takeaways all the time. And I don't know if that's good or bad for actually improving, but you know, it's uh, it, it'll certainly be something a little bit different for better or worse. Right. Yeah. The, uh, uh, Michael, was that your answer to that question? Mostly, yeah, I think just, so. just, just that, like, <laughs> I, I think, I think working on a podcast on it, what I really mean is that working on a podcast on a regular basis, especially one where we're doing kind of bigger picture training grounds a lot, is forcing you to, to attempt at least is what you're learning in individual games of magic and extrapolate that to kind of bigger picture stuff. Um, and I don't know if that's better or worse for actually becoming better at playing magic compared to putting more focus on like, yeah mechanical minutia i i'm not sure it'll it'll be easily different probably i would say that in the short term it's probably worse but in the long term it might be better because i know that a lot of the improvement that i've had in magic uh over the last like year and a half or two or whatever you know since since you and i have been playing magic a lot together has been very much uh based on broad things that that you've taught me well i i appreciate the idea that i've taught you anything but that's, that's very kind <laughs> Michael and Matt, thank you so much for being so good at what you do. Ever since Andrew suggested the show to me, I've been hooked. You've helped uh, me see that being competitive doesn't have to come at the expense of enthusiasm or love for what you do. Know that despite the big names are coming in to take your place, you will be missed. I appreciate that. It's yeah. very nice of him to say. I think yeah, that's... but you know, hopefully not too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think other comments will echo this. Matt's surprised by it, but a question but oh well although my technical skills improving were a product of my work i don't think i would have been looking for areas to improve or working as hard without this show i've enjoyed every episode so far so thank you for being co-host um i i appreciate that i i think that sometimes trying to work on bigger picture things rather than just trying to improve with the deck you're playing sometimes like you almost need an idea of what is available to work on to work on it. I, I, I know I'm that way. Like if, if I'm not sort of constantly cognizant of, of what I'm, what I'm looking for, I can play a lot of magic just like, and I'm sure my sequencing gets better, or, you know, little things, but w without making big picture improvements. Matt. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm, I certainly do appreciate any uh, anybody that got anything out of the show. Um, I I think that you're going to be going on to better things. So I'm I'm just <laughs> I'm happy for the direction that the show is going. But uh, I'm glad that people enjoyed what we did so far. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rip Hinderocker, your monotone and tireless commitment to calling BS will be will both be missed. So <laughs> somebody else has got to ch keep me in check now, Michael. Well, somehow my guess is that, you know, Seth and John like probably have pretty strong opinions. My my, my guess is <laughs> that their issue will not be that they're too wishy washy. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. How do you feel about Michael's that, that would surprise me. That yeah. would really surprise me. Probably. Now how do you feel about Michael's monotone voice? Yeah, I mean obviously I enjoy it. But <laughs> <laughs> it's it's impressive. It's impressive. <laughs> it's so soothing. He, I just don't. I, uh, I just don't know how he doesn't have a career doing YouTube AMSR videos. Sure. Is that, that how you spell? Video, really? Is that how you spell that? I actually don't remember. Yeah, I I know what you're talking about, but I think the secret to that is that you have to be a lot more attractive and of the other gender. I think that's <laughs> the the only. Uh, the only people doing ASMR, oh. like you know, buy an expensive microphone and like scratch rugs in front of it, and you know, things like that. I'm 
scratch rugs in front of them. I don't yeah, even know what that movies. means. They're really weird. If you haven't watched an ASMR video before, you should really watch some. Because, like, it doesn't do anything for me, but, man, it's it's, like, worth experiencing as a genre regardless. <laughs> This is okay. this is the most off topic not magic that's ever been on <laughs> constructed criticism. I mean, I, I, if there was someone I could plug specifically, I would, you know, be trying to get a referral bonus here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really have anyone in mind. Uh, I'm sure someone can link you in the in the All right, group. Michael, why don't you read the next one? Uh, let's see. Uh, how will this new version differ from previous versions? Will you all still play test and potentially do a monthly, quarterly episode roundtable of constructed formats? It would be nice hearing everyone's voice once in a while. Uh, so if uh, so, here's the thing. Uh, Michael and Matt have the same invites that everybody has. It's been a ghost. Like on big episodes, you're always invited back. That's not even like a question. Um. Just that's just tradition at this point. Uh, as far as like how will the new different version, it'll just be. So like a as the shows progressed, mm, I've <coughs> the I've become less of a peer to Michael and my my other co-hosts. It's been mostly while Michael's been on the show, right? As Quentin qualified for his for his first pro tour, it became like Quentin tell us about this pro tour and how things went, right? Um, and then uh, we went back to the show and like how are we how are people preparing what are they doing why are they doing it right and there is a narrative to the show in that sense um, but it, it's it's kind of an undertone of the show and that will just change because now my co-host will like Michael for most of this I think you missed one or two pro tours since qualifying for your first. Yeah, I, I think I played three both the last two years. Yeah, so so from a lot of it, you know, that's been Michael, and we've we've had other people come on when Michael has missed, right? But we've talked about those type of things, and now that's just kind of always a guarantee. Um, and also the process changes, right? Because because uh, they'll be focused on the things that they're focused on. That's so different from the PTQ grind, right? Um, which is one of the reasons for even odd to, odds to exist on our network is just like it's it, it it would be stupid for me to say that this podcast will be the exact same and have the same tone and feel the exact same way because it won't uh it, it just simply won't there there will be uh it will have um more of a to be honest just more of a limited resources feel and less of a constructive criticism feel but hopefully still keep that genuine like improvement vibe that we try and promote. I don't know. Yeah, I mean I'm sure there'll be some learning curve just, you know, in that like it's a it's a relatively large and you know, it's a change that happens all at once uh, and you're working with new people and just like finding kind of the right flow and vibe for them and you is, you know, probably not the easiest thing, but you know, the flip side is that you are really good at podcasting and Seth and John are both incredibly both you know like really really good at magic yeah I, I I feel like you know overall it's like it's a pretty huge talent upgrade like getting it to work might take a minute but you know it, it it's like the big three right you just you just gotta like it, it has to be massaged and then it'll be fine I don't know how I got compared to Chris Bosch in this world, everybody, but I accept. I accept this comparison. It means you're going to get all the blame. Uh, if you know anything about Chris Bosch, he gets blamed for everything. I mean, I already knew that to be true. That's why I picked Chris yeah. Bosch, obviously. Yeah, mm. I, well, I knew you'd do that. <laughs> you should have gone for You should have really taken the LeBron one while you had the option. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> that would it would have be, been much funnier. Yeah, it would have been conceded. <laughs> well... Uh, All of this is so lost on me. It's <laughs> impressive. I'm sure it's lost on the listeners as well. So that's basically, what... basically, when LeBron went to Miami, the team struggled for a minute, and all that happened was everyone the side LeBron was the best player in the world. A bunch of crap because the team, like you know, it took a minute for three players who were used to all having the ball all the time to figure out how to share. I see. Yeah, and then they figured it out, and now the Warriors exist. So thank you, LeBron James, everybody. Huh. So. <laughs> that being said, uh, that's like the most personal that this podcast has ever gotten. 
but honestly, uh, I think these guys deserve it. Um, uh, I, I, we honestly, we actually have had patrons um, decide that they don't want to be patrons anymore. Um, that this was the show and the things are changing, and I, I appreciate them for what they for what they contributed to the show, and uh, you know. But also, I I appreciate um, you two. Like, uh, honestly, uh, if it wasn't for the efforts of Michael and Matt and all of the previous co-hosts, John and Seth actually just wouldn't be on the show. Um, and you know what Michael's saying is true. Like, it's it's kind of it is something that I would have dreamed about, right? Like, I love podcasting and podcasting with a Platinum Pro and and uh, the nicest guy on the Pro Tour is like, that sounds sweet. It sounds fun. It sounds like a show I really enjoy doing. So, um, but that being said, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, to be honest, I think I got out all the tears. I think we're good, everybody. <laughs> but I, like, have legit cried about this um, episode just because, um, you know, like, Matt was in my wedding line and, like, Michael and I have, like, shared a bed. So, like, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds bad when you say it like that. Like, no, it's like Bert and Ernie. It's fine. I was going to say, I mean, I've, yeah, I've probably something to say, but as Matt, like, a lot of times, just, yeah. you know, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, I think specifically the phrase, shared a bed. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why no. I said it that way, Michael. No, oh, like, I, I appreciate you. Uh, that, <laughs> like, honestly, I, like, legitimately love these two guys um they're just my best friends and i i don't know like it'll be it, i'm legitimately going from hey like do you want to talk in up to a microphone with two of your best friends about magic every week to hey like you are now producing a magic show with like people that are counting on you to produce a magic show whereas like before i was counting on matt and michael so it was <laughs> it was just it, it's a difference in in roles and it's it's exciting but uh man, I'm gonna miss you too. <laughs> oh, we're gonna miss you too, man. It's been it's been fun, really. Yeah. Um, but certainly being... certainly happy to come back on any episodes where I'm invited in the yeah you know, in the big picture things. And you know, obviously, we'll just figure out how to get Matt into doing a video series with me again. So you know, <laughs> he, he's not gone. Like, don't even can't have too much free time. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'll rope him in. You guys don't worry. Uh. Okay, let's go on to the training grounds this week. So, as promised on the brainstorming episode, I wanted to what, what to think of what card really exemplifies Michael Hinderocker. And I mean, obviously, Matt, it was Collected Company. Yeah, I actually talked to Michael a little bit about what cards that I thought defined him, and I would have picked I would have picked Thought Knots here. I don't know if there's any any validity to that, but that's the card that I associate with him the most. I always run really odd when I play that card. I'm just like the luckiest person in the world when I put Thought Knots here in my deck. Uh, I know that uh, Casey Bloodworth is apparently like a savage cabal therapy player, but I don't know if it like, makes it that person's card. Sure. Yeah, oh, I, man. So, I certainly associate him with, with Graveshot more than anything, but mostly because he carried the Graveshot in his wallet for years. Yeah, and even when he took it out of his wallet just recently, he still had it and found it to send me a picture to say that he still had it. <laughs> Yeah. So my favorite game of Magic I've ever played was the second time I qualified for a Pro Tour, and I was playing Bantel Drazi, and I was playing like some round in the Swiss, and I'm playing game three against Burn, and on the play I mulligan to three and keep Eldrazi Temple, Thought Not Seer, Thought Not Seer, Scry Eldrazi Temple atop, and just go Thought Not Seer into Thought Not Seer into third Thought Not Seer on the play. It was like, it was just great. Yeah. Turn two, turn three, turn four. Thought not. you're on the play on a mold of three. I just good luck. To me, sidetrack. Do you know what I remember that RPTQ for most? What's that? No, I have, I have no the idea. The fact that like I was so excited for three of my best friends to be at the Pro Tour, and then two of them got paired against each other, and I was like devastated. <laughs> Which is so funny because like you think, well, like yay, one of your friends locked it up, but it's like no, nah, I, I, I was greedy. I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, I think only four qualified, right? So, like, it was going to... Well, I know, but <laughs> I was greedy. I said I was greedy. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I I only mean that... Uh, oh, oh, right, I guess if four qualified, then... Yeah. I was thinking of two qualified. 
and was like, well, yeah, if there are three of us, then obviously, but yeah. 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 So, uh, all right. All right. But that being yeah, we said, got derailed a little bit off Collective Company, but no, it's fine. It's because we like went all casual at the beginning of the show. So now <laughs> apparently we have to get back into let's talk about magic mindset, um, <laughs> which we've never tried to do before. So Collective Company, uh, I associate with Michael because simply Michael's played a lot of Collective Company next. He really enjoys building them. He really enjoys playing them. I know like one of my biggest associates with Michael is that like the time that I legitimately spent testing with Michael and honestly a huge percentage of that time we were slinging collected companies at each other in paper and play testing yeah i mean that card was like super oppressive in standard for a while and there was a lot of reason to try to be good at like playing my two threes against your two threes yeah um, with that being said, I know that uh, one of the first other things that, Michael, you try to do with Collected Companies is you try to put it in other decks, right? I know that you try to play Collected Company in Humans quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I've played Collected Company in Humans. I've played my favorite deck, the deck that I, like, liked the most out of most of them that I ever really played was, like, the Westvale Abbey Collected Company Crippleth right deck. That deck was sweet. Um, I mean, I've played a lot of Collected Company decks in some some form or another. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Collected Company is an instant for a green and three. You look at the top six cards of your library, you put two creature cards with converted mana cost three or less from among them onto the battlefield, and then put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is when we're supposed to talk about why we're talking about Collected Company, by the way, because <laughs> I didn't read the show notes correctly. Um, but that being said... <laughs> We got through that already. <laughs> yeah, but that being said, um, let's let's talk about two decks that currently play Collected Company, Michael. Um, and the two decks uh, that that are seeing play that I would consider tier one or tier point one and a half are Counters Company and Bant Spirits. But I want to go over Bant, uh, Counters Company first, just because it's kind of the worst of the two decks. Yeah, I mean, I think Counters Company is just like kind of bad, but I wish it was better. It's the secret is that Collected Company is actually really bad in Counters Company. Um, like you play it because I guess you have to, because you know you're playing green and a bunch of little creatures. But it's, like all of your creatures kind of suck, so all it does is try to find you combo pieces, and if you don't find exactly the ones you need, it just doesn't really do anything. To me, Collected Company in this deck is like it's like if you could have a Splinter Twin that was a Splinter Twin like seventy percent of the time or something. Sure, like, and the rest of the time it was like a bag of yeah, whatever cereal or whatever. Yeah, it's just like not it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, that's kind of how I see this card. That card in this deck, Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's probably a little bit overstated, but yeah, I, I do agree that uh, 70s too high. Gen yeah, I mean, well, no, I, I just mean I think it's a little overstated how bad the collect companies are in the deck, but I, I do agree that it's not really a collect company deck at this point. You just have too many things that, like, don't attack or block. Right. So your collected companies basically have to find you either the combo pieces or eternal witness to recollect a company. Like, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, of the, of the list that we have here, we have one list that's playing, uh, you know, four eternal witnesses, which you're automatically going to rebuy. Um, it's got, like, a reflector mage from tireless trackers, course or crew fix. So there are certainly some value hits. And then if we look at the other list, it's got, like, a place out of Night of the Reliquaries and uh, tireless trackers as well. Um, so yeah, I, you, ha sure. you have some you have some collected companies that are reasonable, and the reason I bring this up is because we actually had this debate in the in either the critics store or the constructive criticism family Facebook group at some point, and uh, it was basically should you thought seize a quarter calling or a collected company here? And I know even even when I was talking to you about it, you also agreed that the collected company would have more impact than the quarter calling. Yeah, Cord is really good against decks that are removal light. And I mean, I think in general, just these company decks are great against decks that are removal light. Like, wh what you're really trying to play against is decks that aren't very good at killing a turn two Devoted Druid. Because if your opponent's bad at that, they're probably just going to die, like, half the time on turn three. Yeah, um, I agree with that. That's that's the, the main incentive to play this deck, is that if you're playing against, like, a bunch of people playing Dredge or Tron or things like that, like, you're pretty likely to just kill them. Right. Yeah, I agree. It's it seems to get a lot better in like combo centric metagames because it's just a little bit faster than all the other combo decks, although way more fragile. Way more fragile. But but the speed thing is real. Like it it will turn three on the play 
you know, it's a two card combo, so you can like mulligan and still have it. It, it it's turn three on the play. Like all I remember is the first time we were ever testing this deck, like we, we kept losing most of the games, but like every single game we won was on turn three. Right. And that happened for like a substantial period of time. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's it's not hard to assemble a combo on turn three, even at all. Um, but again, it's just broken up by everything, right? Like any kind of discard spell or fatal push or lightning bolt or just, you know, mostly any piece of interaction. Right. That being said, I, I kind of like the, uh, the direction that things have moved. Uh, some Japanese players started popularizing lists, kind of like the second one. And the main thing that they do is usually play, most of them play Field of Ruin. This one's playing Ghost Quarter, but they would play like a couple of Field of Ruins and some Tech Edges uh, and a bunch of Knight of the Reliquaries. And then Tracker works pretty well with Field of Ruin specifically as well. So there was kind of some uh, like fair game synergy going on in these decks that I, I thought was kind of sweet. That actually, yeah, is, that actually is sweet. And it makes your Quarter Callings significantly better in my opinion. Yeah, just like it just gives you some like pseudo fair game targets if people are playing decks that kill things like Jundi style stuff. Yeah, I mean, and uh, I think that field like having a field of ruin package specifically in that right, you could just be trying to get giant relic like knight of reliquary. But the fact that like field of ruin has double synergy there, and the fact that you're trying to specifically slow down the game with field of ruin. I actually just really like that combination. Yeah, I haven't played that much of that deck, but I it's hung around for a while. Uh, some decent Magic Online results, especially from mostly Japanese players. Uh, and it, it always... It's not a deck that like really stands out to me as something I have to play, but uh, it looks totally reasonable if uh, if the Zero of Remedies is your you know two-drop of choice. Any thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, the only thing I would say is that I'm not sure. I like I do in theory like the idea of building a, a slightly more value driven deck, like where you can win a fair game. But it does make me wonder why we choose to play this deck specifically. If if, you if just, we're going to try to make it, it a little bit more fair, right? Like right. you could just be an e witness this deck and then like play a fair game in like something like maybe uh, bug colors instead, or not bug uh, abzan colors. Yeah, just just whatever else. I'm I'm not sure what makes sense, but like something similar to the uh, to maybe like the uh, the Nightfall deck um, with or without Retreat Core Helm. I'm not sure that that's even necessary, but yeah, I, I think specifically this was more about just trying to add some pop to your collected companies. I doubt you're courting for Knight of the Reliquary very often, but I, th I think this was mostly about just trying to like bring up the average collected company. Sure. Do you, that's that's what it looks like to me. This question could be like legitimately crazy. Don't get me wrong, but I have actually never played a game with this deck, so I just wanted to give you guys the floor on this one. But is Shyla a direct response to the just one hundred thousand percent increase in settle the wreckage into the format? Like, what is the reason for that card? Are you talking about Shalai? Shalai, sorry. It's a win condition. Just oh, it's just, so that you have something to do with the infinite mana. Oh. Oh, it, in, does it, it, did, did I miss it beats, that it didn't like, have It beats Ballista? like Stony Silence or whatever, you know? Like, it's it's something oh, you can okay. bring in also when you're be bringing in Stony Silence. So it's just another way to use all the infinite mana. Okay. It's kind of like Ronus, except it's like a lot less bad. That right? makes way, way, way more uh, sense. But the flip side is that, yeah, I mean, if you if your opponent, like, settles the wreckage and you're like, yeah, response Court of Calling for Shalai, I'm sure that's a beating. Well, yeah, definitely. I, did, I just didn't, because... I, I did, I forgot that it could do that, like the Ronus effect in the deck. So yeah. that makes sense. But but also like if they're just playing Burn in game one, that has to be a pretty hot core target. Yeah, it's just better than Ronus. Like it it does the same thing as Ronus when you're trying to win the game, and then it's just better. In, yeah, like, yeah it's just places. a totally reasonable real creature. Like yeah, that makes Walking Ballista is also like kind of a real creature. Like sometimes you're playing against Infect, and you're just like you know turn three Walking Ballista for two. So right. I I know that for some amount of time these lists had actually moved to more walking ballistas because it had gotten like good in the meta um but they decided to scale back because they're really really bad when you have collected company so yeah it's nice yeah, it's definitely not something you want a company into cool well uh let's move on to our next deck that i want to talk about to let's talk about core decks or not core decks <laughs> company decks um is bant spirits so I I have two spirits lists here. 
Um, but the first thing that I want to talk about for this one, just because it's the company episode, is how does Collected Company impact this deck, Michael? Well, Collected Company is kind of bad in this deck, except that it lets you hit the lock, which is really sweet. Uh, basically, if you get like double Drug Skull Captain in play, you pretty much always beat everything. So the sweet thing about Collected Company in this deck is that sometimes you get double Drug Skull Captain and your opponents are sad. Um, the thing that people have been doing, I think this is a Zan Syed innovation, is playing reflector mages over summer all paths yeah uh, and it looks like the list that actually won gp atlanta this weekend was only playing two paths and had three reflector mages uh i'd seen some lists that were playing them the fourth aether vial as well but yeah. that both strength strengthens your companies a little bit and great it's really really a, a nice innovation yeah and sorry this this actually was these this should these show notes were written before the GP had ended, and I meant to go back and check, and I did not, so I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but let's actually let's actually use that list, Michael, if you'll send it to me really fast. Um, because I would like to talk about, like, first of all, how, because I was going to talk about it in the show, the fact, because I know that Mason also had been pl uh, at the Grand Prix, uh, played that same innovation with all Reflector Mage and Zero Path. Um, yeah, so the, the one that won was playing two paths still, and only the three vials, and then three reflector mages as well. But and maybe maybe that like little bit of in between is better. I, yeah. It's hard to say. It also lets you cut a geist, which I really like. Yeah, geist is just like kind of bad in general if people aren't specifically playing a lot of jazz guy. Um, I, I I think that really the like making an effort to make your collected companies a little bit less anemic makes a lot of sense. Matt? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I agree that these are going to make your collective companies quite a bit better. Um, I, I wouldn't even say that they're necessarily anemic. They're just... They were kind of they're not the, before, they're not right? the They're not the stat sticks you expect them to be a lot of times, right? They're going to be... like well, You, you look like, at the deck list and you kind of expect them to be like... And especially if you played a lot of standard, like you expect collective company to be like 67 power a lot of the time, but that's just not going to be true in spirits. Like often you're... You have to time your collect companies really well. Like you're often trying to hit specific things when it makes sense. Like either you're trying to hit spell quellers, or you're trying to hit rattle chains, or you're trying to hit selfless spirits, or drug school captains to give hexproof, or yeah, you know, was... supreme phantoms to to puff your bump uh, buff your guys. And it it's really important to know what you can hit off your collect companies to know when to cast them in this deck. I was gonna I say this yeah. deck is like far more bant company than other company decks that you would have played in standard, right? Where like like there were like it's like it's like puzzle pieces company rather than val value only company uh if yeah you, if you kind of remember those different iterations so like there were green white decks that played company right and then like there were band decks that played company but uh, when i think about company a lot of times i think about like uh the minutia of when do i cast this company now that spell queller exists specifically that era of company is the closest to this because you look at Drog Skull Captain, you look at Phantasmal Image, you look at Rattle Change, you look at Selfless Spirit, you look at Spell Queller. It's like you look at your I mean your other lords are kind of just there. And I mean and then you look at Geist of Saint Draft, like how you how these fit into it and like what percentage you have in your deck. So like understanding when the the best time to cast it is actually kind of important in this deck. Yeah, I think I would say my biggest complaint before was that your companies just kind of lacked pop. Like a lot of the time. If you're not in a position where you're trying to defend something specifically, like Mausoleum Wanderer, Rattle Chain, Selfless Spirit, uh, even Drog Skull Captain, all kind of fall into the category of like try to save a creature. But you'd often be in spots where like what I really need is like Lord Lord, and Reflector Mage gives you like at least something else that just impacts the battlefield. I, sure. I think that just having more hits, like Geist, obviously is fine if you hit it on an end step, but it's pretty bad if you have to like main phase a company and take a Geist. Sure. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, since Supreme Phantom came out, though, like, I mean, you have twelve lore, or you have eight lords in the deck, plus like phantasmal images often function as an extra lord as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that definitely. Uh, I, I just think that having more stuff that like makes an impact on the battlefield right now, uh, having a way to get rid of problem permanents or problem creatures at least through collected company is. Oh yeah, just, you're certainly you're certainly not going to hear me come down on the other side of. 
you know, collect companies make your yeah. <laughs> your, I mean, the uh, reflector, major. reflector major makes your collect yeah. companies better. That's right. for sure. Um, but I mean, I played a lot of like rally in standard. And if you want to look at some anemic collector companies, like man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i said i mean one of my favorite decks was like the blister pods with the board cut so sure yeah you like that's the collect company hit two cast, blister pods and you're like uh. i cast my fair share of collect companies into two blister pods but <laughs> there was there was uh I, I don't i don't remember which deck it was but we were like tracking michael's collected companies throughout a tournament and those like average stat was like one two at the end of the event <laughs> sure we were, like, i probably like won the event i remember <laughs> winning a lot with that deck despite the collected company being kind of awful yeah yeah so that's that's great so outside of collected company though like what is going on with bant spirits right now because this deck has picked up a lot of steam steam as one of the possible best decks in modern if not the actual best deck in modern i think it has pretty good game against unfair decks even without hate cards just in that it has a lot of interactive cards like you know mausoleum wanderer uh, spell queller stuff like that but then you also get to play some pretty hateful sideboard cards like some combination of I, I guess this list is playing Tormod script but you can play like sideboard counter spells rest in peace stony silence and thalia's when you want them so I, I think that like where a lot of decks to beat something like dredge you basically have to draw ley line of the void this is the kind of deck that can sometimes like beat dredge in an entirely fair draw in game one and there aren't a lot of decks that fall into that category yeah definitely yeah i i agree i mean i think i think bat spirits was debatably the best deck uh at the last modern gp that we had and then people kind of forgot about it as you know guilds of ravnica came out we got some sweet stuff with dredge um people were trying a bunch of different things to beat that and it was kind of left by the wayside for a little bit, at least for me, um, from my perspective. And a lot of the online results would really echo that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this this weekend at the GP, it was almost certainly the best performing deck. And it really just proved that it, it still belongs as a contender for the number one spot. Yeah, Spellqual is just really, really powerful. Um, it's, it's, you know, when it's bad, it's bad. But when it's good, it's fantastic. Uh and Mausoleum Wanderer continues to be sort of, you know, flying wild in the coddle slash spell pierce baby, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, that's like, certainly got if, my vote for the best yeah. creature. Maybe maybe the best card in modern. It's just if if you've never played with it, you can't really appreciate how busted it is. It sounds mopey. Like I totally get that it sounds mopey, but it's like wild in the coddle with flying that also counters a spell that would kill you sometimes. Yeah, that's, it's, I mean that's it's like a that's a pretty long list of things basically delver of secrets card. that uh you know counters a spell when you when you're gonna need to unless you, or, you know, always or die yeah <laughs> it always flips exactly yeah it you know it's, it's it's better than it's better than you would think if you haven't played this deck i can guarantee it it's funny because this is actually a huge thing going on in my head right now as uh you know I, i'm kind of locked into a deck on legacy so i just kind of need to get reps for from my next event uh where i'm going to be playing gracious control with uh, Matt and Quentin at SCG Vegas, um, I kind of can take my br my feet off like the gas and uh, do some other stuff. And now I'm going to be playing in a 1K with Matt this weekend. And I, you know, I was kind of just trying to figure out what to play. And Matt and I discussed Volokut a little bit. And uh, then the GP happened, and I was like, man, if people people like love decks like Spirits uh, around here, and I don't know that I want to play Volokut against this deck all day long. Even though it's been like a good matchup, it's just a lot of spell quellers to play against, potentially. Yeah, I think this deck has a really weird combination of explosive draws that are good against sweepers and ending the game with spell queller chains that I don't, like, really think big mana is where you want to be against this deck. Yeah, and I'm, I think that the fact that big mana decks won... What two modern events in a row really were people were like, hey, remember that this is a deck in this format still. I, I think this deck can struggle with Amulet Titan a little bit just because it's harder to interact with those spells. Um it's harder to interact with Azusa than it is with really have a good like, sideboard for it though. Like just by 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 playing a white deck in general, don't you have 
things that you've been doing? I guess I haven't thought about it that much. I mean, rest in peace, Stony Silence and Thalia all don't really do anything. That's um, fair. I guess if you're not trying to disrupt them on the right axis, maybe it doesn't work. It's it's a little bit... I, I mean, I wouldn't say that the matchup is like a slam dunk for Amulet. I would just say that it maybe... I, I would rather play Spirits against Valakut than against Amulet. Well, I would too. I would just... I kind of expected that like a com combination of white cards and counter spells would just be good against that deck. It's okay, but the, the thing is that Spirits, like... It's not fast enough to beat just, like, turn 4 Primeval Titan into turn 5 Primeval Titan a lot of the time. And when your ramp isn't based on, like counterable spells most games that makes sense it's a little bit harder to to turn off that angle of attack in my experience from both sides i've actually played both of these decks a lot and yeah yeah and i've I say that the matchup is great for amulet but it's certainly not like a yeah. matchup you're horrified to see i've only played banned spirits here and i've never once played against amulet with a deck i just kind of assumed that i mean looking looking over this i think that i would board in Unified wills, disable strokes, but but maybe that's just you know not not enough. I, I also they're, they're fine. They're fine, right? Like they're they're totally okay cards to sideboard, but yeah. you know it's also easy to imagine that I, like I had one counter spell doesn't always win the game. I had assumed that I would be boarding in Thalia's, but maybe I just wouldn't. I don't, don't think, think they does do anything. anything. Yeah. I, I yeah. think like if you played like Damping Spear. That would be good. I like. I think there are ways you could construct Bant Spirits to have a better matchup there. I just don't know that. It doesn't matter enough. It's not enough of the meta, but right. Yeah. No. What's I... your thought on bringing in worship in that matchup, Michael? Um, maybe it's good. Yeah, I... I'm thinking about it now, and it seems kind of hard for them to be. I'm not sure what like. They're probably gonna keep Rex Age in just because you're like. Are they playing? Could be playing Damping Sphere. And likely are playing vials at least. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, I, you keep Rexage in a lot. It as a one of, so it's hard to say. But I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm not saying worship. Worship is not a card you probably want to play against with Amulet. It doesn't sound like something I'd want to play against. So where do we think that like this deck? I mean, this is the face of collected company decks right now. So where does this deck sit tomorrow? Like, is this, I mean, the, the list that just updated, I, I think this is sweet. This is something that I'll probably stream this week. Um, is this, is, is this, like, kind of middle ground, right, with, like, three Reflector Mace, two Path, a little bit less, less Geist? Is this the real deal? Because this looks sweet to me. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody that's ever felt like Spirits wasn't the real deal. Um, ever since, like, M19 came out, it was pretty much been... A mainstay at the very least That's a decent yeah at least a decent choice and i i think that really like what makes me excited about this deck is that it's a deck i can legitimately sleeve up and feel like my dredge matchup is acceptable yes right like there okay. there are a lot of decks where like you can get them with sideboard cards sometimes but you're basically never going to win game one and spirits is a deck legitimately have a chance to win game one and i i think that like you're just at a big disadvantage when you're trying to play sideboard. Like, when you're just like, yeah, I'll lose game one and then draw a hate card both board games. That's that's just a harder plan than it sounds like. Definitely. And it's not like you're even skimping on the hate cards. Like, you have so much of it in sideboard. No, there's still some rest in pieces, and, like, Thalia's pretty good. And it, there's there's a lot of things that seem totally reasonable. Um, right. But you can hypothetically win a fair game, and that that counts for a lot in my mind. Like, I... If you wanted a reason to play Tron, I think that's one of the reasons to play Tron as well. You can sometimes actually just be Dredge, you know, hey, without drawing Relic. One of the <laughs> things mentioned on the game podcast this week about this deck specifically was uh, Brian asked Jerry why he would pick humans over Bant Spirits. And I found Jerry's answer really interesting. He said, I just think humans is better. Um, one of the things that I had talked about, and I, I don't remember if I mentioned this to somebody on Twitter or in the Discord, um, but I kind of talked about how uh, myself and some of my friends talked about how humans sometimes is inconsistent. Matt, did I talk to you about this? Yeah, you talked to me about it a little. So, uh, so I'd love to kind of talk about like this versus humans. Like they are similar decks. I'd love to talk about that. I would say humans is the much more like 
medium good version of Vance Spirits. I would say that Vance Spirits is a lot less consistent than humans. I, I think that's my biggest frustration with Vance Spirits in general. Yeah, I, I agree. When you have everything with Vance Spirits, you just basically can't lose. Um, especially now, like it used to be that the humans matchup was actually pretty bad, but now I think that if you just have all of it, you're probably actually possibly favored even like especially if we're going to start playing reflector mages like between supreme phantom being a two mana lord like i mean they obviously have lords as well but there's or you know starting as one ones and you're sort of as one threes and have flying and like the the biggest card that will still just always get you like in the humans matchup specifically champion of the parish will beat you on its own what feels like an unreasonable amount of the time right I will say from the Bant side and the human side, having played both of these decks kind of a lot, uh, Champion of the Parish is really the key to winning for the human deck. Um, and and I, my, my, my the, the biggest issue I think you'll notice really quickly if you play very much Bant Spirits is like games on the draw without a Noble Hierarch, you're playing 12 three drops and Collected Company. So if your opponent like disrupts you in any way, uh, yeah. You, you just have a like a, a number of games where you kind of fail to fire. So the reason I actually played this deck, Michael, is I think it was on the podcast. You and I had a conversation uh, about a deck that played a Avacyn's Pilgrim in the main and whether or not we liked that. Um, and I, I actually, that's why I played the deck is because I actually really liked the Avacyn's Pilgrim as a one of. And you actually described like one of my biggest problems with the deck. So I'm, I'm glad that we're kind of on the same page there. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, obviously Spirits is really good. I, I don't mean to say it's bad. I'm saying that usually when you lose, this is what happens. I, my, my guess is that you're probably supposed to treat it more like humans in mulliganing um, and mulligan more aggressively than, than certainly has been my inclination. Uh, like, I, I know that most people say, like, the golden rule for humans is no sevens without a one. Right? You just never mm. keep a seven without a one. Sure. Um, I think I that's think, probably true in this as well, right? Like yeah. you don't you don't keep a hand without vile noble or mausoleum wanderer. Yeah, the secret being that mausoleum wanderer is like a tier below the other two as your one drop. Sure. Like you need more specific cards with in Mos combination with mausoleum wanderer for me to for me to be comfortable calling that a one drop that I'm like leaning on. Yeah. Like on the draw, especially, I'm not that inclined to call mausoleum wanderer like relevant unless i also have like two into three sure yeah obviously any hand where you have supreme phantom the math is totally right then, then it's because then mausoleum water better. is like the actual best one drop right right exactly so i i think spirits is really strong um i do think it's a really good deck uh it's a deck i played a fair amount with uh i would just say that i i don't know if it's just a me problem but i found it a little bit inconsistent at times i think reflector mage would smooth out some of my issues with the deck um makes a lot and of sense I, to I'm me. I'm curious to give it another try. It also, it also once again reaffirms my want to play an Avacyn's Pilgrim, to be honest, though. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. The, How would you the feel spirits, about... I think, one of your big selling points is card quality. Yes. Um, humans is much more of like a mass deck. Yeah, I... So, what it, uh, maybe I might stream this with would you guys cut a phantasmal image or something else? Probably not that one. Um, I I would, yeah, it's tough. I don't want to cut a phantasmal or or a two. It's probably just the Geist of Saint Draft, honestly. If you're if you're really looking to cut something, I think I would play the fourth vial before, before the, the first, before the fifth dork, and I think I would then cut all the paths for all reflector mages if I wanted to try that. Yeah, that seems believable as well. That seems like, like if you cut path path for fourth mage, fourth vial, that sounds like a direction. What, what I would say is that like that my biggest takeaway between Bant Spirits and Humans is that in Humans, Rising Canopy is one of your best cards, and in Bant Spirits, I think it's one of your worst. That makes sense. Okay, I might, I might, I wonder how close that list is to what Mason just streamed, though. So I'll have to check with him. I'm sure it's close. I, I, think, I mean, I think that's he, probably basically exactly what I was going to say, I wonder what Zan Said's list was. <laughs> so. I'm sure I can pull it up real quick. Uh, it's, if you make, you know, he's playing three selfless, two rattle chains, two phantasmal, no uh, main deck. 
no main deck or sideboard geists, but that's basically just the deck. There you go. All right. Zan Saeed, Bane Spirits Master, everybody. We already knew that. <laughs> we are, that was already factual. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, any tips and tricks that you guys have for Bane Spirits before we go? Just be very aware of the potential cards in your deck, or, yeah, the potential hits in your deck for Collecting Company. Um, just cast it yeah, when it makes I, sense. That's a really good one. I think just trying to figure out what your best hits are, but also what your... Like, what is my total number of this effect? If I cast it now... I mean, we, we talk about this all the time, basically, but, like, kind of what are the upsides and downsides of doing this in this order? Um, and then in addition to that, I think there's a lot of the same stuff going on with, like, Selfless Spirit, Drug Skull Captain, uh, like, casting Spell Quellers as attackers, right? You, you, you have a lot of things that you can, like, cast on your opponent's end step if they don't act. And one of the hardest things in this deck is trying to figure out like when you're supposed to play things as you know ambush vipers versus when you're supposed to try to get the effect right uh my only tip is that i know there was some debate whether or not you're supposed to play the rattle chains or not um in my experience i, th I think that you are supposed to play it i think the la all three of the lists we just looked at are playing the one with rattle chains um i know a lot of people wanted to move to just selfless spirit but i, I think rattle chains is is worth it as a one of yeah, yeah zan's playing two the biggest uh, thing I like about Rattle Chains is that it gives your other spirits flash. Like I, I'm not yeah. even. I'm pretty lukewarm on the actual hexproof thing, but two one flying flash that also gives my other guys flash has actually been really important for me. Yeah, yeah. It, it lets you like hold up Spell Queller a lot easier. Uh, it also lets you use Drug Skull Captain as a second Rattle Chains a lot of the time, which yes. is pretty sweet. Right. That's actually why there's, I like it. Cool it stuff. If you don't have any Rattle Chains in your deck, it makes your your um your captain so much worse. Yeah, and even beyond yeah. that, like like Michael was saying, like not only can you cast selfless Sp or spellqueller rather as like a just a two three flash flying, but sometimes you're kind of priced into it. And if you have rattle chains in play, you won't be priced into it as often. Like you can just flash in a selfless spirit instead and get the same amount of attack. Right. Uh, Draw captain's even better, but in that way you can yeah. hold up the spellqueller. And just just to clarify why this is happening, like a, a lot of the time you'll be in a spot where you're like, I think I have to hold up spell quiller this turn because my opponent might play X, and then they don't, and you're like, oh, well, I didn't cast Draw Skull Captain during my main phase. Maybe I'm just supposed to take this turn off again. But if you have a rattle chains, this just isn't a this isn't a thing that's happening to you ever again. Right. Yep. Yep. So like I said, I, I think that it's important to at least play yeah. one. Uh, this sounds like you said Zan was playing two, so there we go. Yeah, that's that's sweet. I, I think it's really fun, uh, and if you've never played with Mausoleum Wanderer before, like, that card is really, really good with Supreme Phantom. I'm going to say something blasphemous to a lot of people, but as somebody who's, like, cashed, like, five SEGs with Legacy Merfolk, this deck plays a lot like Legacy Merfolk did back in the day. So. Just. Yeah, you're kind of on the Mono Lord plan with some good disruption. Yes, that's the entire deck. It's just, like... One drop or disruption creature, or like an ether vial or something, something to like give me a mana advantage, like lords and disruption, and then spell queller instead of other disruption. It's like the same deck, I promise. <laughs> so, all right, let's go on to our patron call. So, uh, right now we will be making uh, new tokens for John and Seth, um, and possibly myself. I'll get the same guy to commission the art, so I don't have to commission an extra art, to be honest. I don't know. Unless you guys want a new one, I'll do it whatever you want. I don't care. But we're, we're going to make get new tokens made uh, with, for Seth and John and stuff like that. So go to patreon.com slash ccmtg. If you're not a patron already, uh, you can sign up for a tier that will get you those tokens too once that goal is met. So uh, that's patreon.com slash ccmtg. Also, um, uh, we will, I'm gonna, I got some feedback that I did a bad job of announcing this contest and like where we're at with it. Um, and Matt has also pointed that out. So, uh, I, so the the contest is if you uh, have bec have become a patron, or if you are already a patron, you are entered into a drawing to um, to get uh, a place out of any card you want in standard. Uh, and uh, people didn't know when it was ending. They didn't know when they were supposed to sign up. So, uh, I, I'm going to extend it. Um, and I'll, I'll post something in the Constructor Criticism Family Facebook group, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, with that being said, uh, you can join the Constructor Criticism Family uh, by by going to Facebook and clicking the Request button, and then I'll approve it. 
and then you can uh, join the Discord. You can go to Heasy Game Media, or you can actually find the link to the Heasy Game Media Discord on our bios page at constructorism.com. You can find me at Spencer Each. You can find Matt at the Witchling. You can find Michael at Magic Mike MTG. Um, and yeah, you can find the show every week at CCMTG and at constructorism.com. Uh, with that being said, uh, so with that being said, this is it. This is the end. Uh, I try to hold them off as long as possible, but uh, I just, yeah. Do you guys want to say anything, Matt? Um, it's just been a really good time, and I, I'm always happy to hear that anybody took anything I said and and had a positive. It had a positive impact on them. So I really Michael. do appreciate everybody, Michael. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure, we do this to try to help you guys get better at magic and hopefully learn something to help ourselves in the process and it's 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 nice to hear that uh that you all have enjoyed this as well so thanks thanks for listening and that's it uh thank you to you two so much um well i'm gonna turn this off before i cry thank you everybody for listening and we'll see you guys all next time <laughs>